Hi. <clears throat> I, I guess you thought it was comedy night. And I know what you're thinking, another Chinese stand-up comic. <laughs> I'm very grateful to the organizers and uh, to you for coming out. I was pretty sure no one was coming, but that's not the case. And uh, I'm grateful to be here, to be able to speak to you and to uh, tell you about a long journey. And I'm, I'm also thankful to the Common Land because they are supporting my work and my research. And there's a whole lot of other organizations that have let me continue to study for the last 20 years. So I really need to be grateful to a lot of different organizations. <clears throat> so I, uh, I dropped out of college because a professor told me I would never work in journalism. And then I went overseas and worked in journalism for, for a long time. And um, I covered big stories like the rise of China from poverty and isolation, the Tiananmen tragedy and the collapse of the Soviet Union. But in 1995, the World Bank asked me to film uh, a baseline study in the Luce Plateau. And you'll notice I'm still wearing the same clothes. So. <laughs> <clears throat> but the Luce Plateau is the cradle of Chinese civilization. And it's in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. It's an area, it's approximately the 640,000 square kilometers, approximately the size of France. And it's named for its geomorphology. This is a sedimentary soil, which is created by windborne, uh, it's, it's created by the movements of glaciers and then deposited on the plateau by wind. And it's a very fine powdery soil. And if it has organic material in it, it's very fertile because it's very minerally rich. But uh, if it's lost its vegetation, then it's not quite as uh, amazing. Now, if you dig around in here, um, it's possible that you'll find some interesting things because this was the birthplace of the Chinese race and the early dynasties were all based in this area. And it must have been a very nurturing place. This was to the, this, this is now in the southwest of the Lys Plateau. And if you go to the northeast of the Lys Plateau, you find the Mongolian steppe. And these are perfect systems. So it's, there's a lot of evidence that the Chinese race emerged in a mixed forest and grassland ecosystem. It's very similar to the Rift Valley, actually, in North Africa. And <clears throat> there's evidence of humans, according to the Chinese, in this area for a million and a half years, compared to maybe five million in the Rift Valley. And this was most likely the second place on Earth where settled agriculture began. So, in 1995, when I was asked to go there, I was astonished to find a completely ruined landscape. And I couldn't imagine that the largest ethnic group on the planet came from a place that looked like the moon. And I didn't know enough about ecology. I'd been covering these uh, geopolitical events, and I, I just became fascinated with this. And it started a very long inquiry, which is continuing. And what, what I found was that this area was so miserably poor. This was one of the few places where people could not marry because they didn't have the ability to take care of a family. And essentially, their behaviors, their activities, were the cause of the degradation. So the more they did, the worse the situation became. And they passed this on from generation to generation. And 
the Chinese in other parts of the country were getting rich because they were participating in the global economy, but this place was miserable. So to their credit, the Chinese government said, well, we can't just leave them out there in this ruin. So they decided they were going to do something about this. And they also have a lot of scientists. I, probably if you're in universities here, you see a lot of Chinese students coming and they're all studying very hard. They're very hardworking. And what they found was that if you study this, you can really start to understand it. And going there, it, 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 it made me question a lot of things. I began to question. I began to question why do we spend all of our time thinking about the news? Because nobody talks about the news. And it made me wonder why did a place which was so wonderful, clearly it must have been nurturing, turn into a complete desert? How did this happen? And so I followed the story and I found that I could understand it and I've, I was fortunate because I was working with some of the best scientists in China and some of the best international experts from the World Bank and other places. And essentially what they'd done is they had totally devegetated the area over historical time. So being completely fertile, they had cut the trees, then they did a type of Neolithic agriculture, and then they free-ranged goats and sheep. And what this did was alter everything. So it changed um, gas exchange through photosynthesis. It altered nutrient release and nutrient recycling, and it massively changed the hydrological cycle. And then this, the, the, the rainfall was no longer nurturing but became a kinetic force, which at that scale was horrific. And so the sediment levels, the sediment uh, deposits going into the river were causing floods. They've been keeping records for quite a long time. There are 1,500 recorded incidents. And there's a, this is a strange phenomenon where where the, the mud creates a kind of, you know, <laughs> bizarre thing. And this is, where, this is what causes the dust storms, which are, you know, go up into the atmosphere and affect all of Asia and then beyond, because you can find these deposits going around the world. So if, if that was the whole story, it's a pretty miserable story. But this was the rehabilitation project. So in the period that I was documenting and in the years to come, they the Chinese with the international help devised um, a restoration scenario. And they used GIS, which is a very useful thing to completely map every, every watershed. And then they used uh, a type of enterprise software like like I guess uh, you know Oracle or or SAP or something, and every investment, every intervention rippled up the management chain, and then they used participation to engage the local people in understanding what they were trying to do, and they made a, a, a huge plan which engaged everyone into this. They, it, was, it was quite interesting because the people's behaviors were causing the problem, so they had to shift them out of these behaviors. So they took all of the negative behaviors and they banned them. So it became illegal to cut trees, and it became illegal to farm on any slope that was over 25 degrees, and it became illegal to free-range goats and sheep. So they had to go and explain to the people, by the way, everything that you're doing, you can't do anymore. And then the people are like, well, what are we going to do? And they said, well, you know, you're going to transition into something else. And we're going to engage you in this process. You're going to understand it. And so they used this participatory mechanism to, to engage them. And then they did something else which really worked well. They paid them. 
I think this is a, you know, probably something we ought to consider. And <clears throat> by paying them for 10 years, they transitioned them from poverty in a single generation. And the children of illiterate peasants go to top universities in China. And not only this, but the outcomes ecologically were quite interesting, which we'll see in a moment and which maybe you're gonna already know a little bit about. But what we see here is, is water harvesting mechanisms. They're making terraces, but it's not a terracing project. It was actually many different things. It was a holistic plan. And by, by doing this work, they're getting paid, but they're also learning sustainable behaviors to replace the unsustainable behaviors that they had in the past. And after 10 years, their old behaviors are just memories, and their new behaviors have become habits, and they've been carried by subsidies through this period. But what's interesting about this is this type of work is not simply self-interested. This is working to restore hydrological function at scale. And so this is affecting ecosystem function. Now, if I think about what I've learned here and I think about other places, think about the Mediterranean or North Africa or the Sahelian region or Central Asia. And so in 1995, when I first took this picture, this is what it looked like. And the next picture is going to be in 2009. We made this particular film at the time of the Copenhagen COP15. And this is, this is something that I think no one who was there in the beginning actually thought that it was possible to restore these things. We thought this is a poverty reduction you know, project and, and it goes on and people get a little bit better. But then we found that this is something completely different. This is a paradigm shift. And it's, it's affecting fundamental processes. And as I started to understand this, I realized the Chinese government, the World Bank, they're, they're trying to, to raise people out of poverty. But what's happening here are that fundamental evolutionary systems, which have been damaged by human impact over historical time, are being restored. This is of enormous importance at this particular moment. So <laughs> hydrologically, this was restored. Sediment control alone justified the entire investment, $500 million was invested over a period of 10 years in an area approximately the size of the Netherlands, but it was entirely justified simply by sediment control. So the returns have not actually been calculated because it was justified only by sediment control. And there were many more returns besides simply sediment control. So we need to, to think about this. And I began to compare what's the relationship, how important was my interview with Deng Xiaoping in 1986 as compared to the ecological outcomes which are gonna determine the quality of life for future generations on the earth. And I, I saw that we're talking about things which are in, at different orders of importance and I became rather philosophical. And I started to think about time, that we're just passing through. We've had maybe, what are there, five generations in a century or, you know, and we're, we're here, we're, it's our moment to live, but we're, we're not here for very long. And geologic time and evolutionary time 
and human history and then our very short lifespan. And I realized that in Earth time, which we're told is 4.567 billion years, something like this, when the Earth began, it was a molten rock surrounded by gases which we couldn't process. And over prodigious time, the Earth was transformed into a beautiful garden. Now, in religious cosmologies, human beings emerge in paradise. And in evolutionary thinking, it's possible to see human beings emerged in paradise because there was fresh water, there was an oxygenated atmosphere, there was tremendous biodiversity. It was wonderful. So there's no difference between the religious cosmologies in the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition and evolutionary theory if you look at it from this perspective. And of course, that cosmology goes on because human beings sinned and then they were kicked out of the garden. And I started to consider this and I realized I think I know what original sin was. I think from this perspective, you could say it was the reduction of biodiversity because it led to the re reduction in biomass, which led to the reduction in the accumulation of organic material. And this altered photosynthesis, it altered nutrient release and nutrient exchange by reducing the microbiologic level, and it massively altered infiltration and retention of rainfall. This is exactly what you see in the Lus Plateau, but it's not only there. It's in every cradle of civilization all over the world. <coughs> this is simply cheating to show you what it looks like when a cheetah is nursing in the wild in the Maasai Mara in Kenya. But what, what I found was that it was important to realize that what I was doing was studying function and dysfunction in terrestrial ecosystems. And mostly I was studying dysfunction because there were these huge, vast, degraded areas. And they were making me a little bit depressed. So I started going all over the world and looking at functional ecosystems. And they're wonderful. There's nothing wrong with the Earth. The Earth is in great shape. And we need to understand what these what these natural forces are doing because they're extremely powerful and we cannot interrupt them. We can try and we can do some damage for a while, but in terms of geologic and evolutionary time, it's nothing. And in, if we do this, we will face the consequences because as that cosmology says, the wages of sin is death. So, we're looking now at enormous species die out all over the world. And when you see this kind of phenomenon, you have to realize the top of the food chain is most at risk. This is us. When humans went to this area in the Andes, they called it paramo, which means wasteland, because they had no idea what it meant. Biodiversity meant nothing unless we could extract something from it we didn't understand the natural principles which are causing life, which are the basis of life, and we didn't give them the correct value. We valued derivatives which are extracted and manufactured and bought and sold higher than the source of life. And when you do that, you create a perverse incentive to degrade the natural ecosystems. <coughs> And this is what has been happening around the world for all of human history. And if we don't understand that, then we pass this 
on to the next generation. So this has come to us, but now we're seven and a half billion people and we're adding a billion people every 12 years. So we're sort of at the end game and it's not possible. Now I found these long-term evolutionary trends, biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter. If you don't remember anything else, try to remember these. Biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, these are the basis of the atmosphere, the, the soil fertility, and natural infiltration and retention of moisture. They're hugely important. They're the determinants and the indicators for survival and sustainability on the earth. And I found that really we're just looking at two states, functional or dysfunctional. And functional is nice and it has all these wonderful things about it. It's robust and resilient. It's actually eternal. And dysfunctional is linear and it's degrading and it's finite. And these processes are going to re-establish re themselves. Now this is interesting because the, if you look at this, this is the trajectory. They were on a path that leads to ecosystem collapse. And it took them some thousands of years to destroy that region. And the degree of degradation, you know, it's it, it just different. But when they made an intervention to change the outcome, that's the paradigm shift that determines whether human beings, if we understand this and the meaning of this, we can survive. If we don't, we're headed for collapse. We're altering the climate. We're altering, we're losing species at an unprecedented rate. The oceans are endangered. We're in trouble. So this is critically important. This is Neolithic agriculture. It's still being practiced. This is in Ethiopia a few years ago. You can see this in South America. You can see it all over the world. And what, what, what happened, and when you look at modern industrial agriculture, it, it's coming from this. This exposes soils to air, wind, water, and sunlight. You don't see that anywhere in natural systems. And we're, you know, we, we, this is, well, this is tough. We want one thing. That's not how nature works. And the outcome is that you end up with a degraded system. So when you extract, you're basically mining, and you end up with, with, because you've created this perverse incentive. This is an indicator, high sediment loads, seasonal stream beds that are floods in the rainy season, and then there's no water left in the system. These things we can understand, but we're not processing it because we put the value in the derivatives. We said the things that we're taking out had more value than the system. It's false, it's a mistake. And any civilization that went this way failed because they collapsed their ecosystems. So if we don't learn from history, we're destined to repeat it. There's all kinds of scientific theses laying around if any of you are in school and want to study these things. And they seem to be extremely important. I mean, I was a dropout and they keep giving me more fellowships. So if you, you know, you serious students might do well to, you know, follow this. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's not an academic exercise. It doesn't matter how many papers we publish or what kind of degree we get. It depends on whether we process this information and there's a paradigm shift in human understanding 
at this particular moment in human history because we are now at the end game. We're at the end of an era in human history. It cannot go on. So the petroleum age, the fossil fuel age, is going to end. It's, it, it's over now. We're just not, we're not reacting to it. What we need to do is look, we, we have to acknowledge this dysfunction, but then we have to look at function. And we have to ask, why is this happening? Why? Why is a dangerous question, isn't it? It's really, it's really rough when you get to this. So why is this happening? And I, you know, I've, I've told you what I think. I think that we have put the value completely wrong. And this is a, a, an enormous mistake. And it's a mistake which has a lot of precedence. And it took me a long time. I went to a lot of places in order to consider these things. And what, what you see, look at, look at the canopy here. The highest canopies in climax canopies are 100 meters high. Where have you seen that lately? Look at the veget, look at the, look at the organic layers, look at the biodiversity in, in functional systems. It's amazing. It's completely different than anything we see in domesticated places. So we're not considering, the, you know, the, the, this stuff, we, do, we don't eat it, we don't sell it, so it's nothing. Well, that's not true. This is the basis of fertility. This is the basis of, of, of infinite potential variety in genetics. Don't mess with these trends. They're too powerful. Human beings don't quite understand it. And we also, we, we now have to start thinking because we, we think this is our land. This is my country. You know, we need to act as a species on a planetary scale. We have to have a conscious evolution to another, another worldview. We're not consumers. We're human beings. And our purpose in life is not to accumulate material things. It's not to buy and sell or to differentiate ourselves from other people. We're a separate species, but we need to get our identity as a species together and we need to act. Because if we don't, we're facing predictable, catastrophic outcomes <coughs> now. So this is not happening in the future. This is happening now. And I started to realize a lot of this in Mali. I went to Mali with uh, Wetlands International and the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And it was uh, a remarkable thing because Mali is a very big country. It's a million, 200,000 square kilometers. This is approximately twice the size of France or France and Spain combined. And it has 14 million people. That's like the population of Los Angeles in twice the size of France. And according to the United Nations Human Development Indicators, they're the poorest people on the earth, or almost. You know, maybe there's one or two countries below them. You know, but, but when I got there, I see this enormous system. The Niger River flows out of the Ghanaian Highlands. It rises six meters across the entire interior of the country. What is going on with that? I've been to Bangladesh and the Everglades. I've never seen anything quite like this. And people know what to do. They get on boats and float away, and, you know. But, but basically, 
we say this is nothing. Well, if you go to the NASA satellite images, you see what this is. This is the hydrological regulation for the entire Earth. It can't be zero. And it's ridiculous because we now want them to extract something from the system in order to buy tennis shoes or a cell phone or a bicycle. We're facing climate change and this is the place where natural climate regulation takes place. They're the richest people on the earth. We, you know, I'm starting to understand Voltaire lately because we're into absurd <coughs> thinking. We really need to look at this. These, these are specialized freshwater mangroves that live half the year underwater and half the year in dry land. It's extraordinary. But they have to cut them down because we, we don't value the system which is regulating the Earth's hydrology. It's bizarre. So Molly was a wake-up call for me because all the normal indicators are false. If the, if the United Nations says that these are the poorest people on Earth, they don't, then they're, they're saying the natural regulation of the climate at a time when we're facing climate change is zero. Well, that's ridiculous. I, I, can't, I can't imagine it. So, but, but it's true. It's, it's happening. And I started to realize that what we're seeing is it's interrelated. It's not separate from what's happening. Why are these systems degraded? Why are those societies in Africa in trouble? This is tough. It's coming from a historical valuation of money. And what is money? Where did it come from? You know, how, how, did, how, did we, how did we make this mistake? It's a European problem at this, at this point. The Chinese have a lot to do with this, too. They invented, they invented money long ago. But really what happened, this is connected to divine right. This is connected to slavery. This is connected to imperialism and colonization and mercantile expansion after the Industrial Revolution. And we, we said that things which we understood and extracted, manufactured, bought, and sold. And then magically, somehow, the speculation between the cost price of things, and then suddenly, interest-bearing debt was the basis of wealth. Well, this is essentially saying that wealth or value comes from scarcity. And it looks to me like we got it exactly backwards. And that that's actually creating poverty. Because it's creating the mass accumulation to a few people, but billions of people are in poverty at the edges of huge degraded ecosystems. And in the natural systems, you see something completely different. And it's those three things, biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter. And in these places, it's where you can breathe. This is the place you can meditate. This is the place where you have species of life that only exist when there's no pollution. This is the places where you have this incredible diversity. It just assaults you with its beauty. Butterflies, orchids, it's wonderful. And it's in these other places where we've lost this. What are we thinking? You know, what, what, what are we thinking is valuable? We're, we're thinking that the things that we make are valuable. They last for a few years. They end up on the junk pile. And they're toxic. 
to boot. How, how, could, how could it be true? The natural ecosystems are more valuable than anything that human beings have ever produced and everything that human beings will ever produce. And it's, it's a question of time scale. And it's a question of understanding. We're from different cultures. We're here for a few years, a few decades, but we're communicating using abstract thoughts. And we're communicating across generations. And we have a duty to recognize that our economy is now corrupt and corrupting. And if we pass this to the next generation, then we're too late. It's been passed to us, but we need to do something. This is a turning point in human history. Transformational change will come. I was on the front line watching the Soviet Union collapse. It will come quickly. And it's okay. It's inevitable. And it's, it's a good thing. We need it. This is like the flat earth, round earth moment in human history where there are institutions and laws which are dedicated to maintaining something which is false and wrong. And, you know, it just, it just cannot not be. The emperor has no clothes. This is also similar to the time of slavery. At that time, it was possible to sell people in the marketplace. Holland was deeply engaged. And these things changed. And now we have an economic system which is, it's impossible. It's impossible to infinitely grow something with finite resources. It's immoral to base something on divine right, slavery, imperialism, colonization, and mercantile expansion after the Industrial Revolution, especially when it means crushing societies whose worldview is that everything that lives on the earth is sacred. We need to, we need to process this. And we need to consider the lessons of the 20th century, Gandhi and, and Nelson Mandela especially, I think are very important because it's not about blame. It's about truth and reconciliation because we can't go backwards and change what happened in the past, but we are definitely defining what will happen in the future. And if we get this right, we'll, we'll have a flowering of human civilization. And if we get this wrong, we're gonna go down. We're gonna go down very, very fast and very, very hard. So if our money and our economy were based on ecologic function, what would happen? That would mean all human effort would go to conservation and protection of natural systems. That's exactly what we need at this time. We know that it's possible. We need to get our mind around what it means. All of our problems, including the wars, including the migration, they're all symptoms of this. I think this is what our, all the generations that are alive today have a duty to make this happen. This is not up to individuals. This is not up to a single race. It's required that we work together as a species on a planetary scale. And remarkably, our technologies are making it possible for us to communicate with every human being on the planet simultaneously and instantaneously. 
And organizations like Common Land are coming up with practical solutions to make restoration into a new industry. If we're not buying and selling things, can we have growth? Can we have a return? What the common land is talking about is four returns. A return of inspiration, a return of social capital, a return of natural capital, and because of this, a return on investment. This is something worth learning about. Please go to commonland.com. There are already projects in Spain, Australia, and South Africa. And this is happening very rapidly. And it's not only this, this organization. Many organizations are seeing. I mean, when I started to do this studies, I think it was a very left field sort of thing. But now, every, everybody in the United Nations and all over the world, and uh-oh, what did my computer do? My computer just technology is only, you know, it's not that great. Um, you know, it's probably got to restart. Okay, well, let's have the question and answer time. Because I, I was going to give you my, my email address, but I'm easy to find, so. Thank you, John, for your inspiring very, very interesting.